Hey everybody, it's Tom here from Peach Guitars. It's um, John's day off, so for some reason he's let me do this interview type thing that we're doing. I'm here with Joe Morgan from Morgan Amplification. How are you doing, Joe? I'm doing fantastic. It's fun being here. This is a crazy shop. I don't know if any of you guys you need to come down and see this because it's just, it's massive and you guys have one or two of everything <laughs> that a guitar player could ever want. Uh, and the store is set up so that you can, uh, demos are easy. This is just a really, really killer guitar cool. store. Thank, thank you, Joe. Cheers. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit, obviously, about your amps yeah. that you built. So um, how about we start? How did you get started? Well, um, I got a, a loan from the government for half a million dollars. And I was like, how can I take a half a million dollars and turn it into $50? So, <laughs> now, I, um, I was a guitar player. I played hardcore punk rock in the early 80s in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and had a lot of fun doing that and um, really didn't care about my guitar tone all that much and um, in fact I didn't even know that you had to tune a guitar to a particular frequency. We, we were having a rehearsal and uh, the bass player of the replacements, Tommy Stinson, came by and the bass player in my, my band and I were tuning up and he go, yeah, I go, Paul, give me an E. You know, we're tuned to E and Tommy's mortified and he's looking at us like, that's not E. <laughs> you guys are you guys are anywhere close to E and then he bought us a tuner, so that was cool. But um yeah, I stopped playing guitar for a long time and then got back into it. And um for me, when I got back into guitar almost ten years after that, I um I bought a uh ESP L T D Kirk Hammett signature yeah. <laughs> model with the pointy headstock and the Floyd. And a Galen Kruger backline two fifty. Nice. Right. So I had the sweet setup, yeah. right? <laughs> And then uh, I was listening to the Almond Brothers uh, on VHS. That's how long ago this was. And I'm like, I can't. I'm trying different pedals, and I, I can't get that tone. How do I get there? Right. The Almond Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I went into a guitar store, and the guitar store was this uh, old guy Jesse, who uh, had been on tour all through the '70s and had been a roadie. He'd been around the block. He just Jesse smells like rock and roll. So. I said, hey, Jesse, where's my disconnect here? And I showed him the VHS, and he didn't say a word. He just grabbed a, a Les Paul off the wall, took me into a back room, plugged me into, I think it was a 75 four-hole, 100-watt um, super lead on top of a 4x12 with greenbacks, turned everything up to 10, handed me the guitar. I was like, oh, okay. Get it now. <laughs> yeah, and that was an epiphany. So then after that, you know, I started chasing tone. I started chasing, like, for me, it was more like... Um, it was more like going to the library and like wanting to check out the right books so you yeah. could, you know, understand Swapping the authors. Yeah. Like, dude, I went through 500 guitar amps in two years. And the economy was good. I could put them on my American Express card, keep them for a month, sell them. Sometimes I made 100 bucks. Sometimes I lost 100 bucks. But, um, you know, I'd be able to get like a two rock custom signature for 10 grand. Yeah. And then I'd buy the, um, I forget what the little one was called the, but it was like 3,500 bucks. Mm. And I'd compare the two and go like, you know, why do I like this better? Why do I like that better? These, why is one 10 grand? Why is one three grand? And with the same feature set. And, um, but I did that with everything, whether it was vintage gear, whether it was super boutique -y stuff, you know, and on some things I learned that I just, I will never ever bond with this particular amp or this. And then it was, I'll never ever bond with the style of amp, mm -hmm. right? So for me, I learned that channel switching amps and I just don't get along. Yeah. I just, I'm not a fan of them. I don't like, they're just, I'm not that player. I'm like, I, I don't, I would don't want a channel switching amp. Prefer to do everything. Yeah, everything. I like to have everything in my hands well. and, um, and with a pedal board and I just found like the like an old Vox or Fender or Marshall that kind of stuff I really gravitated towards uh, but the big problem for me was you know finding the right you know 61 62 AC 30 that hadn't been molested that isn't going to break down you know that you know didn't cost 3500 or 5000 dollars you know it's like it's hard to and then once you get it you don't want to let it leave the house so right, so if you're gonna go place some place, yeah. yeah, now you've got a five thousand dollar paperweight, <laughs> you know, or a conversation piece when people come over, right? Yeah, it's like, what's that? Wow. Yeah, it's but nice I mean, <laughs> yeah, so I got to the point where okay, I'll chase it in a boutique world. Okay, this is what I like. Now let's see who's doing this. And I bought tons of boutique gear, guys that were making AC style amps, 
and it, to my ears, it was like, have you guys actually even heard an AC30? Because mm. these are cool amps, but they all sounded modern, and the, the mid range was off. You know, yeah. there's always something like, you know, great amplifiers. I mean, they but they weren't that thing. They're missing the magic of yeah. There was something one. they did their own thing really well, and you know, professionals were using them, and I mean, they're great amps, but they had that a missing component for me, mm. and so I started building, and. Uh, and more for me than anything. And then from that, you know, somebody came over to my house and said, uh, you know, I was actually fixing his hand wired AC30 and he plugged into an AC20 that I'd built. For me, that was actually, it was just like, a, it was just a chassis, right? Yeah. And tubes and stuff, no faceplate. Otherwise, and, yeah, all over the place sort of. Exactly, right? It's just this thing. I built it, I, I was playing at a great big church and I had a seven o'clock call time and it was PM and I was three in the afternoon. I didn't have an amp, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but he played through that one and said, this is the sound in my head. Yeah, you know? that's the sound he's like, searching for. Yeah, and I'm like, that's me too. That's, I mean, that's why I built it. And um, so he wouldn't leave until I sold it to him. You know, he gave me a check. He said, you really should start an amp company. And I'm like, no. I don't need to start an amp company. But if I did, there was another amp builder <laughs> whose cabinets I really liked. Yeah. yeah. And I said, but if I did start an amp company, I'd want to use the, the whoever this cabinet builder is. I would like to have those cabinets, but it's not like I can call up, a, you know, what would be a future competitor and say, hey, who makes your cabinets? Because I'd like to poach that guy. <laughs> right. And uh, so, you know, fast forward a month or two and my daughter was selling a drum kit on uh Craigslist in, in California and the guy that came to buy the drum kit um, walked into my garage and saw the amp parts and said oh you make amps I built all the cabinets for it and I'm like you gotta be kidding no no way has this yeah. just happened this guy just walked into my garage and I'm like okay I the, I got so the universe is telling me something yeah <laughs> I gotta pay attention to this at this point you know it was a smack in the head and I had a great job and a company car and an expense account made a lot of money and, but I decided to just throw all that away. To build amps. To build guitar amps, <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, you know, it's, um, although, like, I was an electrical engineer. I worked on the first generation of GPS satellites. I've done, uh, I've done a lot of really cool things. Um, but, you know, you, you ever feel like you're made for something, right? Yeah. You have a purpose, and it's like, when you find that thing that you're, that, when you're, yeah, when you're tuning for it finally goes off and you go like, okay, you know, good or bad, this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, this is what I'm meant to be doing. Yeah. Everything's so, come into a line. Let's do that. And it's, it's, for me, it's been an interesting ride because it's the way everything's kind of fallen into place. And it's, um, you know, bumps along the road and like learning curve and that kind of stuff. Trying to make the, the right decision, sometimes, you know, making mistakes there. But um I don't think I'd change a thing. I've learned quite a bit. Mm. And the company's at a spot now where um, where I used to, like the original ones, I used to uh, get blank chassis and I'd drill every single hole and use a metal punch and punch every hole yeah. and, you know, drill every single circuit board and stake every... It was like, as yeah. To getting a, a chassis made up with the holes in. Yeah, and... like, that would probably be better. <laughs> um... Yeah, some of those old AC20s, man, they're like, I mean, they're all snowflakes for sure. Yeah. But yeah, some of that stuff, it's like, I'll get one back in for some kind of repair every once in a while. And I just, I look at them and I, so fondly because it was such a labor of love at that time. And, you know, it's interesting how that, it, how it grows out. It's really mm -hmm. cool when you can go direct to a customer and like, yeah, and you know, you're having this conversation, right? And and some of these guys, you know, their careers took off. They got into like bigger bands. They went from basically being, you know, early 20 somethings that were really just figuring out guitar to, you know, going on tour, you know, all over the world. And, you know, that, that part's cool. Just be able to watch somebody's progression yeah. like that. But it was, um, you know, th that was fun. But in order for people to be able to get to your product and, um, and to you know get just more players um, interested in the product, you have to go to dealers. Yeah. 
and that to me seemed like a really easy thing on paper, but uh, it was a when you bit... start knocking on doors, not yeah. everyone opens them, as it were. Because um, I, I believe weren't Peach one of the first guys to be doing them over in the UK? Yeah, the, Peach was my only European dealer for the longest time, mm. and um, he's actually one of the reasons I, I moved on to more production. Because John, I mean, you guys have done so well with Morgan over the years that. John would tell me he'd get a dozen amps in and sell them in a couple of weeks. Yeah. But then I couldn't get any more product to you guys. You'd be waiting on more parts and everything. Yeah, and well, because at one point, I think when John jumped in, I had like 22 dealers, and we could only build 50 amps a month. Yeah. Right, so if every dealer ordered five, let alone 10, you yeah, you <laughs> like, it's, yeah, it gets a little... Like John would put an order in and I couldn't fill it for six months. Yeah, the waiting list would get longer as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, and that sucks, you mm -hmm. know? And it's like, um, it, and it's horrible to know that you've got a product that people love that they can't get their hands on because you're the problem. You're the it, bottleneck yeah, in the you, system, right? I can't build them fast enough and hiring guys didn't seem to work and I, it was trying to find a solution. And the solution for me ended up being a company called Boutique Amps Distribution. Yep. And, uh, and I was actually having them make my face plates for about a year. And I'd, I'd go into their shop in LA and it's like a 100,000 square foot giant rat's nest of people busting their butt. And I'd see all the Friedman stuff that was being hand wired at the time. And yep. it, it was gorgeous. You know, I'm like, okay. These are the guys that I need working for me no sort of I still but. was like dumb enough to think that I could do it myself um, but I was like maybe you know super skeptical <laughs> right and then uh, you know talking to the owners there and you know getting into a contract with them and our contract is you know pretty simple it's the same st they want to make the same product that I was making yeah same process same parts same vendors and um, you know quite frankly they make a better amplifier than I did Okay. Because they're not answering the guys that are building them now, hand wiring them now. They're not answering phones and emails, and they're not multitasking doing every yeah, aspect. Yeah, all it. they do is put some headphones on and wire some amplifiers, and they do a killer job. I I I, I really couldn't be happier with um, the the product. And they at the shop they always say we're building Ferraris, not Fords. Yeah. So I mean, they're really particular about making sure that you know the stuff that we're making is just the best that it could possibly be. Even when you take it out the the cabinet, as it were, it looks good. Yeah. You, know, you look right. The there's no. Side. Yeah. There's no. And if you have to work on something, they're easy to work on. You know, because just that, that's part of my layout and process too. But yeah, it's just absolutely fantastic now, and I'm 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 just so happy. Now John doesn't have to wait six months to get product. <laughs> Which is always a nice thing. Yeah, now it's, I think it's just six weeks. But we're working on that too.
what's your general ethos in terms of your range of amps and stuff? What what are the amps you're making? Um, the great question. I make I basically I'm right now the stuff that we're doing. Like I, I was a little um, scatterbrained and I, I had like something like twenty six different models and somebody had a great idea and they said, hey, Joe, can you build me one of these? I'd be like, yeah, let's do that. It's a whole new model in itself. Yeah. <laughs> so, but when you bring it into contract manu or, you know, manufacturing process, rather, um, and, okay, we're going to make 100 or 500 of these units, then it's like, well, I'm only selling like 10 of these a year. Let's, we don't have to put that one into manufacturing. Right? Yeah. If somebody wants that, like, I still do custom orders, um, Rusty Anderson from Paul McCartney's band came in and he wanted something special and we built that for him and we're actually we've turned that now into a production model because we've had so much, so much demand for it yeah he's kind of like I don't know um, I guess the, the band that he's in is doing well I guess he, you know the people see yeah. him play and, um, Paul McCartney he'll, he'll never go anywhere yeah right <laughs> he's an up and comer though keep your eye on him yeah. um, but yeah, it's that kind of thing. So if it makes sense to put it in, but I still do a lot of custom stuff and those other models. But for the stuff that we were doing, like um, uh, the bread and butter of the line, it really breaks it down into uh, just a few simple things. One is that you know, I mean, I have an EL84 tattooed on my arm. I you know I'm like I'm an EL84 kind of guy. So that old box sound for like yeah. my AC20, my AC40, that's like um, non-top boost. They are the, you know, I'm really trying to capture that 60s, early 60s tone like that. And those amps do that. And then um, I had a, a customer bring me Graham Nash's small special Dumbo from 1974. Yeah, it's like, hey, I just bought this for $35,000. Like, wow, Scott. Um, the SW and my SW amps is a guy named Scott White. Oh, okay. He, yeah, he's a good friend of mine in LA. He's, he's a cool cat. Um, but he asked me to make a copy of it and he just dropped the amp off and his girlfriend was in the car and she was sick. So he's like, let me know what you think. And I said, okay, cool. So I had a buddy who teaches jazz. He was over at the shop and he and I were like, just like, <laughs> you know, you get that thing where like somebody brings in a piece of history. You, you get like, the excitement kick in and you're yeah, like, oh, it's yeah. just, it's like almost uh, it's the butterflies in the stomach. It's the whole... You feel like, like a, yeah, a child again almost, don't you? Totally. Like, oh. Christmas morning. And so we fired that thing up and it was horrible. <laughs> it was one of the worst sounding amplifiers. We were looking at each other like, wow, something's wrong. Is it tubes? It's like, I took it apart and looked, you know, checked stuff out. I'm like, nope. And that's what you get. And with Dumble, I mean, he was... He, and he, he, he did and does build amps specifically for the artist. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like maybe you know whatever Graham was playing for guitars and whatever cabinets that he had and the environment that he had to use it in um that's it was probably very specific for him and for us because I'm not Graham mm. um I couldn't make it sound good but looking at that amp and looking at like just the mechanics of it and the circuit I could see how this hadn't wasn't a completed thought for him, right? Yeah. Where Dumble would later take this into the '80s with like the Steel Spring Singer, and um, it would become a different thing. But I could, it was like, um, see, like seeing an early manuscript of a novel so, yeah, that hadn't been finished. Draft. Yeah, exactly. And so that was pretty cool. So I called my buddy Scott back up and I said, instead of making a copy, let me organize it. Let me bring it in the 21st century and make it work with a pedal board, and you know, it'll have the. Um, I have the fingerprint, if you will, but it'll, it'll definitely sound great and be a little bit more functional. And he was like, sure, that sounds great. Yeah. So that's the SW, which is really for Dumble. What he was doing is he was taking uh, Fender style circuits and Fender, like literally this amp was um, just like cannibalized Fender parts, like Bandmaster power and choke and a super reverb output transformer um, to build the circuits on. So like my SWs, those are truly in a Fender camp, but like I make it, that amp didn't have a mid-range control and didn't have reverb. Mm. So I added both of those things and, but just a kind of a clean high headroom, like the SW22R will compete with a deluxe reverb all day long, but it, it won't flub out as quick. Yeah. You know, you'll, and the headroom will be higher. It's just punchier and it's, it's loud. It's almost like a sparklier, nicer version. 
Almost. Yeah, an optimized version of that kind of tone. And then um, it's the other stuff, like uh, Josh Smith amp I, I, that you guys are, have on order and should be here soon. Uh, in fact, uh, we're dropping one off today, so you guys are the only people in Europe with a JS-12. <laughs> uh, and that's a tweed version that uh, of an amp I built for him for the Grammys about seven years ago mm. when he was in Raphael Sadiq's band and they were backing Mick Jagger. And for TV, it had to be, um, a, they wanted something that looked old. Yeah. So I made a couple of these tweed amps. And it's it's basically a Princeton Reverb that I I used to mod them for pro guys. And then these are all the mods that I made on a Princeton Reverb to get rid of some of that low-end flub, make it more giggable volume to get it up over a drummer. I was going to say, it's, it's a lovely little out. We've, we've had a play upstairs before. and Yeah, it's loud really though, right? Lovely little, yeah, loud as hell. Yeah, it's, definitely. You, you look at it and it's, it's unsuspecting. You're like... Is that going to be loud enough? You yeah. turn it up and you're like, that's loud enough. Yeah, <laughs> that's, but that, that's the PR12, JS12 now with the signature model. And on that, that's, you know, it's right in that Fender camp. So you've got that AC style, right? Yeah. You've got a couple of Fender styles. I mean, that's, that's pretty much my full range. And then I do something like, this is the MVP23. And MVP actually stands for uh, Master Volume with Power Level Control. And the power level is the same thing that you'll find on all my AC amps, where uh, it attenuates the power in the amp from like 23 watts all the way down to a quarter. Okay. And the way that it does that, it does it like, um, as opposed to, if you think about like a, a speaker load attenuator, like, you know, it's some kind of load box or, um, I don't know if they still make the, uh, what was the one from THD? Is oh. that still made? I know when it wasn't Mark Plate, was it? No, it was. Um, I used to yeah, work I'm, I'm struggling now. Uh, hot Plate. It was a Hot Plate. Hot yeah. Plate, yeah. So, um, a Hot Plate, if think of it like you want to slow down your car, your car only goes 100 miles an hour. So, a Hot Plate is like throwing an anchor out of the back of your car to drag something behind your car to, yep. to reduce the, uh, reduce the you know, your speed. And that's not always a great thing, you know. And some of these companies that are building those now, um, they're changing the impedance load. Okay. And if you think about it like this, the lower the impedance, the happier the amp, right? So if you do like, say you're pulling something with your car, right? A two ohm load with your car would be like you're dragging a bicycle behind you, right? The car is not even going to feel the bicycle yeah. as long as it's upright. And then but by the time you get to 16, yeah, yeah, 16 ohm load is, it's more like you've got a small trailer back behind you, right? But some of these companies think it's okay to put 36 or even 42 ohms back there. And that's like trying to pull a semi trailer with yeah. a Volkswagen. It's just a really bad idea. That engine's gonna die. And the engine yeah. being the transformer and the tubes and everything else. So I'm not the biggest proponent of that kind of stuff. Um, there's some attenuators out there that are, you know, that don't do that. But I think that um, modern guitar players that want to use that type of attenuation should school themselves on how much impedance. How they work yeah. and what they're doing to your amp. Yeah, exactly. Because there are some out there that, I mean, they're horror stories. And you, you read that uh, occasionally and you, you hear that, oh, why did this blow my transformer on my 67 Plexi that I'll never be able to replace, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that anyway. But anyway, it's a different type of attenuation where um, a, a guitar amplifier is actually a really simple device, right? We're taking, I'm hitting a note, bing, shaking a string, making a sine wave. Like if you go into Pro Tools and you see it, that's the actual waveform of the music you're making. Um, what we do is a tube acts like a battery, if you will, right? Where we have a plate and a cathode, so a positive and a negative. And then we have a screen and what we're doing is we're manipulating that screen as we manipulate that screen it shakes the voltage and we can then end up by shaking the voltage we add this giant ac signal on top of the voltage and then we use coupling caps because this is dc and dc only pushes the speaker one direction right so we can't have any dc on the signal so the coupling caps decouple the dc and give us just an ac signal out of it right so if I can change the voltage that's available at the power tubes, right? So on like an MVP23 or an AC20, there's 350 volts on those tubes. 
But when you turn the power level down, what ends up happening is you go, you bring it all the way down to 35 volts. And that's like a zoom lens on a camera, right? Okay. You're still looking at the same picture. The camera's still doing the same thing, but you have gotten rid of the amount of mag magnification that that lens can perform by collapsing it. Yeah. And that's what we're doing in the amp. So we can go from like something like that all the way down to a quarter of a watt, right? Well, we it can still talk sounds over the same. Still sounds the same, still behaves the same with the guitar. Like, it'll still clean up as you lighten up your pick attack. It still works with your pedal board the same way. You don't have to change. You don't have to run around and move dials. When the sound guy yells at you and says, oh, you're too loud. <laughs> if you need more, we'll give it to you in your monitor, yeah. right? Exactly. That's and, the one uh, to turn down, though. <laughs> yeah, so now, yeah you can uh, get to the sweet spot where he's happy and then when the drummer comes up and you like can turn it back up again yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like let's go ahead and yeah, let it, let's do it with the snare <laughs> um yeah that never happens though does it no it's always like well i'll just turn it up a bit more you won't notice yeah you the sound like they're looking at you it's like, <laughs> So on all of my amplifiers, um, I'm just gonna throw out this too. There's always an odd color dump, a knob, right? And that's the volume control. Cause when you're on a dark stage, the only yeah. thing that you need to find generally is- The volume. Yeah, the volume. <laughs> so- uh, Need to be louder. You just re you, yeah, you just reminded me of that. So. Only needs to go one way as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Up, more up. So I guess you're gonna have somebody uh, play a bunch of samples here. Yeah, we're gonna get a guy. This is probably where we'll cut into another video of a guy playing a whole bunch of these. Yeah, that. so just for the record, uh, if he's really good, it isn't me. <laughs> <laughs> if he's really bad? Uh, yeah, then I'll, I'll take credit. Okay. <laughs> cool, um, so other than that, I mean, um, John mentioned to me on the phone earlier, you've, just, you've recently moved to Nashville. Right, How, absolutely. How's that compared to LA? Still learning to say all y'all. You have to be able to conjugate y'all in the South. So y'all is singular, but all y'all is plural. Okay. And all y'all is also when you're talking about a really large group of people. So it, I know it sounded exactly the same, but it, and it is. <laughs> but we're getting there. And um, I've fallen in love with things like hot chicken. And uh, yeah, Nashville's really cool. I mean, it's one of the few places left in the world where... Nashville is a city, actually Tennessee as a state, has fewer people than LA County in LA. Okay. Yeah, so it's, things are spread out, it's green, it's beautiful, people are friendly. Um, and then you can go downtown and you can see, you, could, you can see everything from heavy metal to country, and you know, just by going to a couple of different places. Yeah. Um, live music is important to that town. So even when you fly in, you're walking, you know, off the jet and down the the hallway there. You know, you're going to see people playing at the bars that are in the airport. Um, it's just a really, really cool city for musicians. And, you know, it's just, it's fun. Like, it's, um, I don't know how it is here, but in L.A., if I was driving down the street and I saw somebody pulling an amp out of a car or a guitar or something, I'd be like, oh, man, I wonder what that guy's doing. In Nashville... Yeah, it's pretty much the norm. You just, yeah. <laughs> well, you just see people like carrying musical equipment around all the time. Yeah, almost like shopping bags in the streets. Just it, yeah, you almost, the back yeah, you almost feel like yeah, it's like family. Like you guys, everybody's on this kind of like on the same page. Yeah. And since I've been there, I've gotten to do some really cool things. Like um, uh, Joe Bonamassa put um, Joe Bonamassa and um, and Josh were. Josh Smith were uh, producing Reese Wayans from Double Trouble. Okay. All right. Reese had never had a um, a solo record, so they're putting a solo record together for him. So they got together uh, Double Trouble. They got you know Tommy and Chris. Yeah. It's like, hey, you want to come down and watch it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we you know Kenny Wayne Shepherd's coming in you know today, but you know then John Mayer's gonna play on it and like a bunch of really killer guitar players. And it's, it's like mad, isn't it? It is. You know, it's pretty <laughs> surreal. Like, oh, hey guys, how you, you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's just dumb. It is absolutely, it's amazing. And um, on top of that, you know, those kinds of, of experiences are really cool. But it's also there's so many amazing guitar players that are doing stuff with so many different bands, whether they're playing country or whether they're just doing session work. 
and having being able to hang with those guys uh and i mean for me watching a player play through my stuff for the first time that is that is a great player and has never played it before and when they get lost in it yeah you know that's the part for me where it's like when they never touch a a knob you know they never turn a tone control or volume they just make music and smile and laugh that's the part for me when that connected with something yeah on, that's, on a different level almost that's way better than the the company car and the expense account and all the things <laughs> that you know i lived in before i would much rather hang out with musicians that get it and that it just it's just awesome so one thing I, I just want to touch on before before we wrap up or anything, yeah. um, your amps, a lot of them are sort of single channel, but yeah. they're some of the most versatile single channel sounds you can get out of. Right, and that's, I mean, an we were talking about that upstairs. It's the, um, let me bring it back up a little bit here. But like with all my stuff, I mean, the one thing, whether you're buying one of my pedals or you're buying any of my amps, the thing, the one thing that they have to do is you have to be able to, um, they are you hear that term touch sensitive a yeah. lot and it's almost like you know you what does that even mean too much, yeah but in theory every amp's touch sensitive you touch something it's making a noise yeah right but i but get what this, you mean. i want i want to be able to get like if i dig in i want to, it to grind out but if i if i lighten up my pick attack i want it to clean up and then if i bring my volume control down you know it's like you've got super clean yeah, I want I want you to be able to paint with uh, the broadest strokes possible without doing anything. Right? I think to me as well, you get a fluidity in playing with that as well. You don't get jumps in volume or anything. You you get this is me playing. You you are hearing me playing. This is how it should be. Yeah, you don't feel like oh I'm stepping on the wrong overdrive or <laughs> you know it's like, um, but the fluidity that's. I like that because for me, uh, especially on the MVP 23 and, and I make an AC20 and AC20 Deluxe, right? And with the 23 and with the non-deluxe version of the AC20, what I'm trying to do is make amps a little bit more affordable. And one of the reasons that those amps are more affordable is because as opposed to the Mercury Magnetics I use in everything, which are the best hands down, my first choice um, of transformer but they're hand wound and they're ungodly expensive, right? It's like the set that I use in my AC40 versus an AC30 set that they, you know, they're making in China now. Um, it's a $400 set versus a $40 set, you know, it's just, and then for every dollar I spend, it costs the customer. It's you exponential, know, yeah. isn't it? It runs out of control. Yeah, so you really have to kind of watch those things. So, but to get those transformers right, um, I went through 10 sets and it almost took a year. Yeah. But that fluidity thing, there's this thing, right, where it's, where um, the way a note morphs into drive or overdrive, right? It's got to be smooth. Yeah. You know, and like, and the difference is an amp won't sustain. It, an amp won't hang out there on that note. If it's not, it'll start choking on itself. You'll get like you get cross frequency stuff that cancels, and your sustain is gone. And it was funny; it was frustrating too. But you know, I'd have ten guitar players. I'd build a prototype and put that transformer in it, and they'd go, "Oh, you know." Eight of them would be like, "That's great." And yeah. Two would be like, "No," right? <laughs> <laughs> and I would be with the guys. I'd be with the two, and I'd be like, "Yeah, you're right. You guys are smart. You guys are fired." <laughs> and um but yeah just going through that to find to make sure that it, it's we're not compromising anything yeah right so when you buy that less expensive amp you're still getting everything i believe in you know with with no compromises i was gonna say it's ever yeah like yeah. you said everything you believe in in your amplifiers so you can stand behind it 100 percent. yeah and go I, I i never have to make an apology for my amps yeah now for what comes out of my mouth, <laughs> ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, it's it's been really good to talk to you today. Um, again, apologies, I'm not the best interview in the world. I it's noticed that you're just horrible. Yeah, I know. I just smile and nod a lot. That's, that's what <laughs> I go for. <laughs> but no, thank you very much for no, your time. Um, it's been pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you. Guy.